Hello, good afternoon everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Hope everyone's uh, full up after lunch and ready to rock and roll for this session. My name is uh, Arjun Karpal. I'm CNBC's China technology correspondent based in our bureau in Guangzhou, South China. Um, this session today is called Connecting with Digital ASEAN. And I want to just set the scene here. ASEAN, of course, a very diverse region, different cultures, different countries, but a population of over 650 million people. It's a huge opportunity for companies and for governments. But how do you connect this huge number of people? Is there a need to have a coherent regulation and policy? Is it even possible to connect this many people? And what's the roles of some of the new technologies that we've been speaking about here at WEF, such as blockchain, such as artificial intelligence? These are some of the questions we're going to be asking today to this fantastic panel sitting right next to me over here. So let me just kick off by uh, introducing them very quickly. I've got Jaya Jyoti Senagupta, JJ, as he's also known, head of APAC for uh, Cognizant Technology Solutions. Next along the lines, we have uh, Saray Shea, the assistant governor of the National Bank of Cambodia. Next in line, Annie Ko, professor of finance at the Singapore Management University, and then Angeline Tham, CEO of ANCAS. So let me just kick off this session um, and pay very close attention because I'm giving you all a chance to ask a question towards, not everyone, but some people to ask a question right at the end of this session. But let me kick off with you, JJ. Um, and this is one for all of you, so get thinking. What is one opportunity and one challenge you see that ASEAN is facing when it comes to the digital economy? Yeah, uh, the, biggest, the biggest opportunity in front of all of us is connectivity and a seamless trade. And that's also the biggest challenge, that how do we make it happen? We all know the opportunity. We used to talk about data and digital as the new oil. Now we call it as the new air. The question is, how do we make the air pollution free? How do we make the air free for all? And at the same time, accessible to all? Um, OK, I, I just have to put a disclaimer for the rest of the se remaining of the sessions. So I'm from a quasi-government, and on the panels, we have academics and private sector. So when I say something, it doesn't represent my government views. Um, but it happened to be good and lucky for them. Uh, if not, it's my mind. Um, so opportunities. Um, I think is the fact that we are lagging behind and there's no um, incumbent um, infrastructure that need to get rid of. Uh, it, like Cambodia, we have moved from the landline to mobile. Um, that, and, and I can speak for many others um, later on. Challenges will be human resources. Annie. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, this is a great panel, first of all because it, there's more women than guys, <laughs> all right? So we should celebrate that. Okay. Opportunity, youth. If you look at the composition on this panel, we actually have very youthful voices. So I think that's a great opportunity. So people talk about market size, GDP, you know, the population, but to me, the population dividend in our favor, uh, mm -hmm. the large percentage. Now, the challenge is the youth are demanding change. The youths are the ones asking for ASEAN common identity. And the ones that are actually looking at the laws and the regulations are a little bit uh, young at heart, but they're not youthful. So I think that is one of the challenge that we are facing right now. Angeline. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, so I think I definitely agree. There's a lot of uh, opportunities and challenges. But for opportunities in ASEAN, you know, we are 10 countries, and there's actually a lot that we can learn each from each other, from data sharing and knowledge sharing in terms of regulations, what works in one place and what doesn't work and why. And I think if governments start talking to each other, that would really help with what we're seeing on the ground because change is happening so fast. Um, you know, the governments can't keep up with um, legislation on the internet. How do you regulate things that you can't see? You know, what, where, do, where do businesses start and businesses end, right? Uh, and I still think that's a very big opportunity if they can start working together in that one political framework. Uh, and I think the biggest challenge that we have um, for, for the ASEAN is um, how, do we, how, do we deal with, um, how do we deal with this cross-border issues or even in-country issues? So for us at ANCAS, uh, we're basically a ride-hailing app that, um, that focus, focuses on motorcycles, right? So, uh, we have, we have uh, empowered thousands of drivers 
uh, to, to make a very good living for themselves. They've tripled their minimum wage on a daily basis, and all they need to do is be able to drive a motorcycle responsibly. Right? And with that, if all these new entrepreneurs, they never used to be part of the formal economy. So all of them are part of the informal economy. Right? If you look at uh, Lazada or Shopee, right? uh, if let's say you have a 10-year-old baking cookies uh, at home and she's selling it online, uh, if it's in the Philippines, if it's outside, how do you determine if that person needs to pay tax? How do you go after a 10-year-old girl for taxes, right? And in the past, you know, when everyone's an individual, this is not an issue to the government. But when you start putting people on digital platforms in the thousands, in the millions, then this becomes an economic powerhouse and something that the government needs to be able to deal with. Um, and I think that's a very big challenge that they're going to face. Great. Thanks for setting the scene to us. And, and clearly, from, from some of the answers there, data is very important. JJ, you mentioned about data is air. Um, and how do we make sure that's clean air? Um, but of course, there, there seems to be a movement towards silo data, perhaps not sharing data. Governments requiring data to be uh, stored in the country, not easy to be moved. Saray, I want to start with you, because we had a, a conversation a, a few days back, and, and you mentioned to me that you think, at the moment, data flow is, is quite difficult in between uh, countries in, in the ASEAN region. Um, explain to us, firstly, for a central bank, what's the importance of data? And secondly, what are some of the difficulties at the moment? Yeah, I mean, we've been talking a lot about fintech, and um, Prime Minister Modi once said that if you, now today, if you want to get investment into your project, you have to tell them that you are investing on a platform, um, then they pour money in. Um, if you want them to add venture capital to add more investment onto you, tell them that you invest in a fintech space. And if you want um, them to empty their pocket for you, tell them that you invest in blockchain. And so fintech, there's a lot of hype about fintechs, about AI, about artificial intelligence, et cetera. But all these are based on the availabilities of data. And if you don't have data, it will be very difficult. From a banking sector perspective, I mean, now I'm put on my hat as the uh, chairwoman of a, a credit bureau in Cambodia, where we try to sort of um, connect with different credit reporting uh, in the region, and it is very difficult. We are ready to um, get our data across the border for our migrant workers in Thailand or Malaysia, et cetera, because if they have a good credit history in Cambodia, once they migrate to Malaysia or Thailand, they should be able to get access to financial services based on their credit history. And at the moment, we can't do it because of some data uh, rules in some of these countries where they can't do a reciprocal sort of uh, arrangement with us. And so this is in a way uh, a, a, an obstacle for us to, to broaden um, our, uh, our broaden access to uh, finance. And uh, Angeline, for you, uh, data, of course, very key uh, to your business. You're a tech business yep. as well. What are some of the challenges you face around data at the moment? Um, I think the challenges we face around data is like there's so much data. How do you know what's the, the data to be looking at? What's the right data to be looking at? And I think that um, the, the, the real reason, the, the only answer to that is really to try and error. So as a startup, um, you know, there's no fixed ways of doing things. So we always look at data, reiterate, you know, high test, A-B test. And, and I think that's the exciting thing about being a startup. We can fail with our test and just keep trying to, to optimize for, for and better pre results. Presumably data yeah. from perhaps government sources as well could be quite important to what you do. Um, is that easily available for you in the Philippines? So I think in terms of data, I think the one that's lacking is the lack of data. So for example, um, we face a lot of regulatory issues um, with the government for our kind of service. And a lot of times, um, we've had to do the research ourselves. So we had to find the data to show, hey, um, government, there's, uh, this, this, this kind of service has been around for 40 years in this country. You know, X percent of it is uh, happening on the ground here, and it's unregulated, it's not safe, uh, and we want to professionalize this service to make it safer for everyone. So we kind of had to look for that data and present it to the government. And I think that's something that's lacking throughout, um, which is the lack of data rather than, you know, not even sharing information. So. So I think hopefully it's driven more by the private sector to, to kind of take that initiative to share the right kinds of data with the government to, to show them what, what's important. And then it's for the government to validate that this data makes sense and then base their policies off that. Yeah. JJ, let me just pick up with you quickly. You work with a lot of businesses uh, as well. Are they fully understanding the role of data right now in, in digitizing their business? Uh, and secondly, Given the lack of a global framework around data flows, are they getting frustrated and is it potentially holding back innovation? I, I would pick this question into 
two or three different segments. But the first and foremost is that, yes, of course, there is, a, there is an overflow of data today. Like everybody is generating lots of data and everybody is having the same challenge that what do I do with this data? Do I have enough data or do I have not enough data? Or do I have redundant data? How do I keep this data, store this? So there is an immense amount of effort which is going in, in collecting the data first and then to figure out what do I do with it. Now, of course, like our businesses are primarily looking at how, to, and that's where the role of all this artificial intelligence, automation, and algorithmic programming, and all these that we are talking about in implementation of how to make a meaningful sense out of this data is coming in. Now, when it comes to regulations and, and governance, there are, like there are, we are seeing that there are a lot of country level regulations. We have got GDPR, we have got PDPA. So, so there are a lot of country level or continental regulations. There are also regulations imposed by specific regulatory authorities like Monetary Authority of Singapore and, and others. So, so there are different layers of regulation which are created. Now any regulation of course creates frustration. Any regulation of course creates certain ring fencing uh, to the freedom, but this is also an opportunity for all of us to learn how to stay within those ring fence, try to make the most of it, but at the same time, give enough confidence to these regulatory authorities that ring fencing can be relaxed and, and more can be done with it because the algorithms and all these processes are getting stronger. And, and now with 5G coming in, and as we see more advent of connected machines, connected societies and societal evolution, we will definitely see a lot more of this challenge coming in and a lot more of responsible behavior from all sides. Annie, I, I wanted to get your perspective on, on a similar question I just asked, asked JJ, are the businesses understanding uh, the, the role of data and is there a sense of frustration or even is it holding back innovation, the fact that this free flow of data is just not happening at the moment? So, um, okay, so I have to put on different hats. So um, I'm on the board of GovTech and GovTech is the Government Technology Office of Singapore, and uh, the movement is towards making Singapore a smart nation. So I want to say data is critical, and JJ, you asked a good question, uh, data to be shared. Even within government agencies, um, government agencies don't share data with each other. So we are actually having uh, conversations like this. The value of data is not useful if it's not shared. Isn't that amazing? And, um, you know, data shared doesn't mean that it's data lost. It's actually co-creation of the purpose of data. So JJ asked and answered correctly, what is the purpose of data? So that's the first P. But given that it's not your data, it's data from your citizens, from your customers, from your partners, I think the second P, which is critical, is privacy. How do I know that uh, the, the data which I you've collected without even asking from me, for some cases, but because I use a particular service, you've got my data. How do I know that this data you respect and there's a privacy uh, clause and you know, if you do share it, it's aggregated and it's not the individual. And I think the third P, which is very critical in order to get the benefits of the new digitalization is partnerships. I don't think we could go far uh, in this journey as a digital ASEAN if we are not open to partnerships in the ecosystem in which we operate. So if you are working in the wholesale trade ecosystem, then your partnerships are the big boys that do commodities trading and the small SMEs that supply all the different parts to you. The big and the small. It's almost like you have to get the whole ecosystem aligned to the standards, the rules, the governance, the right design for sharing data. So this conversation is critical. As I mentioned at the, uh, the platform speaking uh, conversation yesterday, I am delighted to share that three days ago in Singapore, uh, my senior minister, Janil, has just launched the Trusted Data share Sharing Framework. And if you notice the whole framework there is Trusted Data Sharing. <laughs> so it means uh, within government, government to business, and hopefully business to business outside the country, and eventually G to G uh, within the whole of ASEAN. So there are many steps to go, 
but maybe we could lead by example within the government itself, how are we able to share trusted data? But isn't that also part of the problem because you've got a, a Singapore-based piece of regulation, JJ mentioned country by country, you've got GDPR happening yeah. in Europe, you've got US lawmakers saying well, what we're going to do, California talking about its own rules. Mm -hmm. So there's this huge fragmentation around um, rules around data, whether that be data flows, whether it be data privacy as well. Um, over the weekend at the G20, you saw Prime Minister Abe of uh, Japan uh, put forward this Osaka framework, this, this framework for a, a free flow of data, which they emphasize with trust. So in, in that context, I mean, how, would, how do you see global data rules uh, moving forward? And actually, is there even a possibility of getting to a point where we could see a global framework for data flows? I don't think the entrepreneurs in this room, or people like Angeline, um, think about a global standard when they build their enterprise. <laughs> so to them, they are delivering value, and you are not going to wait for that global standard. So I think we might have a bigger chance if we do by economic blocks, and I mentioned that earlier. So it's not that we don't respect the European EU, GBTR, and we don't respect what is decided at G20. I think in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, and now finally we have an ASEAN community, we are moving towards 2025 as a combined AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, there is a chance if we start talking to each other. So I would like to say at least on this panel, we have a voice from emerging ASEAN from Cambodia, we have a slightly older uh, member of ASEAN, and we have a big uh, Philippine side, although Angeline is Singaporean, Right, but working in the <laughs> Philippines. So to me, and of course, Cognizian, you are very ASEAN-centric in what you're offering. So maybe the private sector can share with us what are some of the ways in which you have been able to connect ASEAN despite all the frustrations of coming up with a single standard. Uh, Surrey, I want to pick up with you uh, just on some of the points that Annie's made. Would you be in favour more of a, an ASEAN-wide data regulation rather than the global rules, which is what some countries are talking about at the moment? Well, first, we need something locally that is strong enough to, to make it happen, at least among government agencies, uh, which doesn't always happen. And then second, we can look within the region. I think ASEAN is very ambitious uh, with its um, uh, vision, with AEC, etc., free flow of everything, a free flow of trade, free flow of goods, free year flow of financial, of capital. And, and so I, I don't know about data, it could be free of flow of data. Um, but to, to be able to, to be fully uh, connected, I think a, a regional um, harmonizing uh, framework on data would be uh, something that is very critical. And Angeline, from, from your perspective, um, from a business perspective, what would you like to see? What would be beneficial uh, for what you do? For data. For data, for data regulation. Um, so I think, I think data is very important. I just want to see from my, my, my point of view, I want to make sure that we share the right data with each other on the private side and on the public side. But as well, um, we, we don't also have, regulate too heavily because sometimes when you, you do everything by the book, let's say the regulations come out like this thick, it's very difficult for business on the ground, especially the smaller ones, to be compliant with like, you know, regulations that, are, that, that make a lot of sense in a big picture, but when you actually have to practice it down um, on, on the ground level, it's, it's almost impossible. So that, that would really hinder businesses. Yeah. JJ, give us the view of enterprise because a lot of businesses we speak to on CNBC say, oh, you know, it's, it's difficult because we've got to comply with GDPR in Europe and then, you know, the US are talking about separate rules. It's to the point I was making at the start. So um, would our businesses advocating some sort of global rules or would they just prefer some more clarity on whatever the regional or country-wide rules are? Yeah, I, I would mean, I would grossly agree with uh, with the opinion of, of my fellow panelists, because I think that a, a global uniform rule is more of an utopia, uh, at okay. least in, in the state where we are all standing today. But, but what we would definitely see, and, and by virtue of my role, I tend to get a, a view of the business environment all the way from Middle East to 
Australia, New Zealand, the entire landmass, which is, which is a pretty complex and pretty diverse landmass. And prior to that, I had almost two decades of working in Europe. Uh, so, so I've seen all the sides of how data protection came in, the origin, mm -hmm. and how it is implemented, and where it is going. So, so needless to say that there will be never an uniform civil code, but we have to agree to a certain rule around classification of data. And, and there has to be like, not every data is harmful, not every data is bad, not every data has to be stopped. Now, how we classify this data and how we create treaties, like, and I will just take an analogy, not the best analogy probably for the moment, but somewhat that came to my mind is, if you see when globalization happened, we fundamentally assumed there will be movement of people. That was the fundamental assumption of globalization because trade was always happening. Movement of goods were always happening. Globalization also gave us the ease movement of people, but still people need visa to travel from one place to another. But within that, we also have treaties like the Schengen Treaty or the APEC Treaty. So, so we have to create this classification as to how similarly data can be also treated and classified like that as to what can move, what can cross the borders of the country. Because I come from the Swiss banking regime and we all know how Swiss banking data used to be. So, so there will be, even before all these rules and all these themes came into play, we knew that this is important, this is business critical. So I think that classification of data and creation of certain regulatory conditions, but with some degree of flexibility, uh, which will allow us to handle this in a more liberal way. I, I wanna just switch uh, track slightly, to talk now about the role of big technology um, in the world. It's something that has been discussed a lot here at the World Economic Forum. And if we're talking about the digitization of us here, and it's very hard to ignore the potential role that large technology firms from both the US and China could play in that. But there's also um, worry from some countries, for example, um, in the US and from some regions like Europe about the power and size of some of these large technology companies. So I wanted to, to get the panelists view on this. Sarah, I'll kick off with you. What kind of role do you see big tech playing in the digitization of ASEAN? And do you see them as potential collaborators or do you see their power just growing too big? They can play a very important role, and I think we can always find common interests and collaborate. Um, I'll give you an example of, th there's a project um, that I've just heard of from a fellow YGL on how Google tried to track and trace the outbreak of dengue fever. Now, you would be able to track the places where this person has been, and then rightly identify where the, the dengue may have come from. This is a powerful, powerful tool to help country like Cambodia, which is now plagued by a, a dengue um, epidemic. But in terms of managing the uh, data privacy, I mean, how much would you allow a company, um, a big company like this with some sort of um, questionable track record on their data collections and, and, and usage? to track everything about you, where you are, and, and things like that. So we need a proper rules and regulations in place for that to happen. But I believe we can make it happen um, with a lot of dialogue and, and, and common understanding. Uh, and Angeline, from your perspective, one thing we have seen is big tech continuing to push into new areas that weren't traditionally their core. Uh, a, a while back, Google yeah. is no longer just a search engine. Facebook is no longer just a social network. So as a startup, I mean, what role, I mean, how do you view the big tech firms at the moment? Um, I think in an emerging market like the Philippines, the big tech firms have actually played a very big role in, um, in driving the economy and the digitalization process, right? So if you look at it five, six years ago, nobody was doing e-commerce in the Philippines, right? It was like, why would I buy something online, you know? <laughs> but because these companies have the technology, the know-how and the money, they've invested a lot on the infrastructure and to build this, this nascent economy up. And, and I think that has also helped empower a lot of people, so like what we're doing on the ground. Um, and as well, um, it's also trained a lot of people to go out to do their own startups. So this also helps create new entrepreneurs in their own right to create bigger bus other businesses um, to help. Right? But in, in that sense, this is also why um, 
but we also believe in regulation. So we've actually created a collaboration between the big digital players um, to create a digital roadmap. Um, to kind of work together with the government to create meaningful laws and regulations in this space um, because we're constantly educating the government to say, hey, you know, with digital platforms, there's a lot of potential. So the potential is that you create millions of jobs for, uh, for new entrepreneurs, right? And then I think also in terms of education, um, it also needs to go hand in hand of teaching the government what the business does and understanding what the business does and, and with that, um, they can also help to regulate better. So if you don't understand the business model, which, we, which, is, which happens a lot of the time, they're like, you know, why, why wouldn't I treat you like a taxi, right? So taxis run 24-7, right? So, you know, uh, we can only limit to this number of people because that's what we have in the market. But they don't, they don't understand the ride-sharing economy, for example, the potential for that. So it's also helping the government understand how the businesses work, and then with that, you can find proper regulation in place um, to put in. So, so I think in terms of that, it, it would re be really helpful to work together with the government. Uh, and Annie, from your perspective, uh, how do you view the role of, of big tech in the development and digitization of the ASEAN region? So if you notice, the two comments from Suri and from Angeli have been, big tech is useful. But again, uh, if you look at a lot of the data, uh, how do we spill over the benefits yeah. that the big tech have mm -hmm. gathered? So um, this is amazing, all right? I didn't even know that, you know, on this platform, I can announce a few things. <laughs> So other than the uh, trusted um, data sharing framework, the government, because this is the uh, Smart Nation Innovations Week last week, has also announced the formation of the Government Digital Office, which has three government agencies coming together. One is the EDB, which is the Economic Development Board. The other one is the Enterprise Singapore, which helps many of our small, medium enterprises. And the last one is the IMDA, which is the part of the IDA that merges with Media Development Authority and work with an ecosystem of companies to help them think digital, move digital, and implement digital uh, frameworks and pathways. So the three agencies have to come together because in Southeast Asia right now, um, the number of unicorns that's coming out, and I'm not a big uh, fan of just unicorns. I believe in um, hundred million dollar type companies than just one single unicorn. But the number of unicorns coming out from Southeast Asia, a few of them are concentrated from countries like Indonesia. We have only one in Singapore, two, all right, uh, counting Grab and uh, Ming Liang's Razor, you know? So do we want only big tech? No. So how do we get big tech to collaborate with the smaller companies? And so this role of this new office is to do a lot of this matchmaking. So I think social benefits do not flow to the citizen on its own. So you need some kind of intervention, but not regulation. So I think the idea here is a government can be more than just a regulator. A government can be the enhancer, can be the platform, can help match companies together so that a thousand flowers, a thousand companies, and big tech should not be a barrier to innovation mm -hmm. because the destiny of ASEAN is to create more entrepreneurs and cross-border ones and not just within one country. JJ, I want to pick up this point with you because there is a sense from the rest of the panelists that big tech can play a role, yes, but there needs to be some essence of caution. From the businesses you work with, what's their kind of take on this? Uh, are they worried about the kind of areas that big tech are pushing into right now, the potential uh, slices of the pie they could be uh, uh, taking right now? Is that, uh, are they concerned about the, the growth of these companies? So maybe, maybe I would like to widen this a little bit uh, for like when we say big tech, like often in the back of our mind, we think of certain specific players. We think of certain specific companies or certain names. But today, as, as digital is practically infused in every part of our life, every company is a tech company. Like mm -hmm. every bank is a tech company. Every insurer is a tech company. Every automotive uh, maker, manufacturer is a tech company. So, so in my view, everybody is embracing technology in such a manner that you cannot really differentiate. Yes, they are using certain big tech companies 
in certain ways. Uh, sometimes we might criticize, sometimes we might appreciate, but what we have to accept is there is no running away from technology. There is, this is a given. This is, this is something where there is no running away that we have to be technology company. Each company in order to survive should embrace technology today or tomorrow. And, and as we do that, either we have to build that technology backbone ourselves as in-house within the company, like somebody might build their own cloud, somebody might build up their own space, own data center, own everything, or somebody will piggyback on something which is already there, already made, and build upon it. But there is no shying away that ultimately, in order to make technology viable, there has to be an immense competition on price, there has to be an immense competition on accessibility, affordability, of course, and privacy, so security. So if this can be ensured, then no company is bad. It's up to how we use them. Great, and, and just building on this point of, of big tech, um, of course, this, this uh, World Economic Forum meeting is convening against the backdrop of the ongoing dispute between China and the US uh, over trade. And one of the conversations we've been having on, on CNBC with many of our guests is uh, around the idea that there could be the development of a two-speed internet, a dual internet, or a splinternet, uh, as some are calling it, where you get dual standards, you get dual pieces of, of regulation, and essentially an internet which is half uh, dominated by China and Chinese tech companies and half by US and US tech companies. JJ, I'm going to kick this question off with you, and, and this is one uh, for all of you, is what's the probability of this scenario happening? And if it does happen, what are, what are the impact when it comes to the digitization of, of ASEAN countries? Uh, I think that uh, isn't there a dual speed in all our lives? Like even today, like I, I was reading a statistics which says that there are more COBOL transactions that are run on mainframe today than the number of Google searches. So aren't we existing with the old world and the new world? So, so similarly in our world also, with seven billion people, with so many countries, and with so many different standards, there may be multiple standards, but we, can, we cannot ignore the, the influence and the powerhouse and the technological advancement that we are seeing in China, that we have seen some of the Chinese homegrown companies achieving and how they have become more international. We all talk about the usual suspects, like we all talk about Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei. But even if I look at companies like SenseTime uh, that specializes in artificial intelligence and algorithms, like the power that, that they have been able to generate nationally and internationally is immense. The talent that they are able to harness, the amount of asset that they are able to create. So I would say that since we all, every business is in the search of asset and in the search of intelligence and know-how and knowledge. No harm in tapping into each other's knowledge, no harm into tapping into, because at least let knowledge be seamless. And even if we put restrictions on data and restrictions on movement, but at least let knowledge be seamless so that we can benefit and we can build it and, and we can build upon that knowledge. So that's my view uh, in terms of the influence of China, but yes, in day-to-day -day lives, when we are doing business, when we are seeing our customers making their business decisions, when we are helping our customers transform their business, we are pretty open to all the technological innovation because transformation is very tightly linked to innovation. Mm -hmm. And innovation is linked to reimagination. Because if we can't imagine what was already happening in a new way, we can never reimagine re and simplify and everybody holds a key to that. So whoever holds a master key to that, we should use that. So Ray, what's your, what's your take on? First of all, I, I agree with everything that you mentioned, but I mean, I don't know how far this trade tension is going to drag on, and I, I all, only can hope for the best. Um, but if eventually there were to be a dual system for the internet usage, um, I'm pretty sure that the, the guy who will make uh, the most money will be the one who will create an interface that people can switch from one to another <laughs> easily. <laughs> the VPN makers. <laughs> Annie? I, I think it's ridiculous because um, internet is supposed to be the whole wide web. <laughs> so the world is supposed to be more connected. So, you know, switching between two different systems doesn't work. I think 
in the past, all right, we can have the right-hand car and the left-hand car driving. We can have different ways of pronouncing data, data or data. <laughs> you know, you could have different systems for measurement. And that's because you go into a country and you adopt that system. But with the internet and with the knowledge and accessibility of information, um, it's, it's really, like you said, Suri, it's everybody's world. So why are we putting up walls when it's actually going to benefit everyone? Angeline? Hey, I mean, I think I agree with all the panelists here, right? I mean, having two systems, you know, maybe maybe the, the only advantage would be it'd be easy, faster to find something perhaps, but at the end of the day, both sides will still find a way to connect. And and it's to a to an end user, it doesn't make a difference at all. Um, so I, I, I think it's ridiculous as well. Angelina, I just want to pick up with you on, yeah. on a point JJ made in, in his answer there, and that was the role of China. Um, you know, what we've seen is, China's technology companies beginning to grow and expand beyond China um, via investments or via launching uh, you know, other products for other markets. Um, what role do you see China playing uh, in the digitalization of ASEAN? Um, and is it a role you would welcome? Um, I think I think China. Ch so okay, so the digitalization is is something that I think every country needs to take on for themselves, and then work as together as a group, as an ASEAN bloc, for example. I think where China can come in is really China has has kind of leapfrogged a lot of the developments that we've that we've seen at other countries that now that that happen in China because. Um, they were a closed economy. So they, they were late to the catch-up game in the tech, in tech space, right? So as a result, I think, um, uh, so it's, yeah, so because as a result of that, they can share how to do that, I think, with emerging economies, right? So that they can benefit from, from, from that leap um, and, and kind of share their knowledge on that front. But other than that, um, I think that as a, as a totality, all, everyone should work together. Yeah. And Annie, your take on, on the role China could, could play here in the digitization of, of ASEAN? Great. Um, Arjun, you're in China, right? You're I CNBC am, yep. and you're based in Guangzhou. In Guangzhou, yeah. Why are you in Guangzhou? It's uh, part of the Greater Bay Area strategy. We're tapping into a lot of the technology that's going in down south in China. Right. So I do see China doing a lot in many ways in the tech transfer perspective. Yeah. I think um, we cannot deny that they have leapfrog and the 4IR has given that opportunity and you don't have to be part of the first, second, third IR to achieve what you're achieving today. Um, but I also recognize, and I think China does recognize it as well, that they are a lot more homogeneous within China. So you may have size, and, uh, but you have only one kind of data within China. Yeah. <laughs> so the homogeneity, the similarity in language, culture, system makes it very easy for China's unicorns to grow big. Uh, when it comes to ASEAN, <laughs> the magic of ASEAN is it's so diverse. It's 10 different countries. I could sit here and speak with Suri now because she's using English, but I don't speak her language. When I'm in PP, Phnom Penh, or in, in Myanmar, I have wonderful friends in the audience from Myanmar. And we are all at different stages of growth. And so what we need from China is an appreciation of the diversity in our culture, in the differences in our economic growth. And it would have been wonderful if China could help us with the tech transfer, but not just based on China's blueprint, yeah. but based on the individual cultural and um, steps and different stages of growth within ASEAN. So the beautiful thing about ASEAN is also its challenge to have inclusion in diversity and to have that partnership with China and India. <laughs> I'm also looking towards India and the rest of Asia. I think um, we are p at that pivotal moment right now to make a difference. And if all countries could come together to help build a digital ASEAN, I think this will be a wonderful use case for uh, G2G collaboration. And Sarah, your, your take on I China's role? I have nothing to add. I think Annie has put it so beautifully. Um, so. Cool. Then let me, ju let me just ask you this as we close out our discussion and I finish the bit where I stop asking questions and hand it over to our much more intelligent audience. Um, what are some of the actionable recommendations that, that you would say on the back of this discussion today? 
whether it be around some of the policy um, initiatives we've been talking around around data um, or, or anything you think from a policy perspective might help with the digitization of ASEAN? Ah. Shall I come back? Yes, please. <laughs> JJ? Yeah, so, so I think that uh, the primary takeaway for us in ASEAN is we have to accept that ASEAN is a very diverse mass of countries and, and there is so much of diversity in all forms like economic development, adoption to IT, the, the buying power and everything. So, so probably we will never have the same shirt size fitting all. But we should definitely have a certain degree of a common code uh, which will guide the digital adoption of ASEAN and then make the individual bolt-ons for individual countries to build upon that based on their socioeconomic needs and geopolitical needs. But one thing is for sure that in order to get digital to be successful, whether we call it digital 2.0 or X.0, we have to be migrating from doing digital to being digital. Till the time we reach that state, this journey is not complete because all of us in each country, in each businesses, in various ways, in our small steps, we were all trying to look at doing digital. We were trying to do certain things which were adopting digital, but we have to be digital and that's what I see as the transition which ASEAN is going through and that ASEAN, not only each country individually, but as a group has to go through with its companies because these policies are not implemented often at a government level, like the building blocks happen at a company level. Uh, the smart city project is not implemented by the government of Singapore alone, but it needs GovTech, and GovTech needs a series of other companies. So, so as it flows down, this vision has to get into a lot more of being digital, infused in the system, infused in the business. And that has to be common across. Like this is where it's a no-brainer in my, in my view. Right? Yeah, uh, first of all, I think um, on the domestic level, we, we need a strong um, and um, or strong rules on um, data privacy and flow. Um, on the regional level, I think we need to overcome individual country national interests for it to happen. Um, we also, I mean, there's so many ways that ASEAN can connect with each other and leapfrog the, um, the, 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 some of the infrastructures. And, and I just uh, remember when we were talking about connecting ASEAN in terms of our payment system, we were talking about a centralized system where every country, national share switch will connect to that system. I think now we can just leapfrog to blockchain. Uh, there are so many opportunities there. So there, there are technology is there for us to connect to each other. It's available, but the regulating of the technology is something that we need to look in a, um, a collectively uh, among ASEAN member countries. Right. Annie, what's your take? Um, very quick one. I think I started saying that there must be a purpose of data, privacy of data, partnerships. I think around the people-centric approach. I call it the fourth P. And I think um, today's conversation actually convinced me even more on this panel that it should not be just the government talking to governments, but governments, businesses, and the private sector and the people sector coming down together. So some of the things the conversation should center around will be mobility, because um, you know university students graduate from different universities and they would love the idea that they could also be heard about where they want to work and how do they bring their new ideas to the different ASEAN countries. Mm. So I'm the voice for the young. <laughs> I'm the voice for the future generations of ASEAN inhabitants. And I think for them, they do want to see that conversation going and doing digital, acting digital, implementing digital, and just not talk about it. And Angelina, I'll give you the final word on this one. Yeah, so I think in terms of, uh, in terms of digitalization, uh, I found that Re, like what really works very well is if you put together industry players together. 
uh, on the ground, you put them together, they can come up with meaningful discussions and thought processes and, uh, and, uh, around what can work and what would help develop everything together. And then all of this would be in coordination with the government to, to kind of keep them in the loop and educate them in the process. Uh, and, and I say this because we've recently worked very closely together with a um, non-government organization in the Philippines called Go Negotio. So they're a neutral third party that has brought together um, players from the public sector, from the private sector from different stakeholders in order to have that discussion in a very meaningful manner. And, you know, a lot of times if you leave it just to the private sector, you know, it'll, it'll just be, oh, okay, all of this, we want all of these things. And then you go to the government and the government's like, are you smoking crack? Like, this is, you know, this is not, uh, th th this does not make any sense. I can't fit this into the framework or the way I think about things. Uh, and if you leave it up to the government, it'll be, it'll come back as a thick booklet uh, with without any practical purposes, so I think what what has worked very well for us has to be to be to working together um, a, as one organization to kind of move faster through this uh, the, the the times because uh, digitalization happens so quickly. Um, something that you put in place a month ago may not make sense a month down the road. So you you also have to iterate much faster. Uh, and with that, I think. Um, if we can have these organizations in each of the ASEAN countries, then we'll be able to understand the challenges that they face or if you're more advanced in this stage, you can teach these other players as to, you know, these are the kinds of things we went through and this is why we think we went through them. Um, and, you know, we just want to share it with you and, and kind of share best practices. And I think this is a role where government can come in um, to lubricate that process or to make that introductions to ensure that these discussions takes place. Um, and, and I think that's going to really help, help us move down the road of digitalization. That's yeah. great. And on that point, I just want to open up the, the floor to the audience. If you want to ask any questions uh, to our panelists here, please uh, just raise your hand. Start here, this gentleman. Just here. Yeah. We've got a mic. We've got a mic. Hi, uh, my name is Jeffrey. So uh, one of the things I do is uh, I'm a social entrepreneur, and we use data to uh, do credit scores for five markets uh, in the region. So we use telco data, we use AI, and we provide credit scores for people who are unbanked. And we're in five markets in Southeast Asia and South Asia, which score about a billion people by end of this year. And I want to ch kind of maybe challenge uh, or kind of put this out as a question to some of the speakers who talked about this trend of data flow across border and the willingness of governments to back it. Because what we are seeing in our deployment is that all the telcos, all the regulators, all the banks are asking us to start deploying on-premise, which wasn't a, a case three to four years ago. So, um, you know, I feel on the ground, what we're seeing is a reversal of the trend of data flow. But what you're talking about is how you envision potentially more data sharing in ASEAN. And I don't know in 10 years time whether you, you think it's actually realistic that we're going to have more data flow rather than less across borders. Is this to everyone? Um, I guess to everyone, but especially to the regulators or to the people in kind of policy. <laughs> <laughs> Saray, you want to kick off? <laughs> um, yeah, data localization is, is a big question. And, um, and now we're talking about cloud computing and how it can add efficiencies to, uh, um, for financial institutions, for instance. What is challenging for us as regulators is, first of all, I mean, at least in Cambodia, we don't have any specific rules on that. Um, so as a reg we, we tend to be sort of like close one eye, open one eye. But given the recent, um, what, I mean, tensions that we observe, there are only so few cloud service companies out there. Uh, a few, uh, two or three are American and you have Huawei as well. Um, and, and what you don't know is, you know, when, when things like this trade tension happen, technology is the first things that will be attacked, right? Um, and for you as a third party country who are going to use you, you try to see, you know, where do you fit in all these problems, ge ge geopolitics issues. So it is not an easy thing for regulators to, to overcome. Um, so there, there's a lot of discussions among regulators around the world about that, and I don't think nobody has come out with uh, the right um, sort of rules. Um, India has just come up with a regulation, I think Singapore as well, on you can hold certain information on cloud, but certain others it has to be um, in, 
uh, local. So, I mean, th this from a um, data flow perspective, it's a form of restriction. So how do we overcome that? I don't know. So Jeffrey, can I ask um, the five countries that you're in, which are they? Right. So they are the countries that have a lot of unbanked, right? And you actually approach the different individual sovereignty in those countries, right? And um, your data is actually um, to help the unbanked get access to credit. Am I right? So you have the right purpose, the right intentions, but why do you need to go to the banks? Why do you need to go to the telcos? So again, um, the non-traditional players might be the ones that you should be approaching. Now, the good news for you is Singapore, again, announced two days ago, is going to issue five digital banking licenses. And it's also to make available, all right, credit to the unbanked. But in Singapore, most of you would say there's no unbanked. But maybe you could play the role of having a Singapore digital license and then make credit available to Southeast Asia. So, you know, it's like... Why do you need to go to the usual suspects? Because today's digital world, your best play can be someone who is not in the legacy system and could see that same partnership value. And I like the statement Angeline made earlier. She said that show your value. I, I like that very much because not every, it doesn't mean that your government means to know everything. So most governments are actually very uh, appreciative when you can show them data that they probably didn't know. But it must be evidence-based, it must be done with good research, it must be something that you've actually found out and worked on it and has a deep understanding. So don't show crap. So you know, so you have to do your homework and when you wear that hat, I think a lot of governments are actually aligned to the same purpose. We want to make available access to capital. And if it can help the unbanked, it's a good purpose, and we should be all aligned. To and, that. and I also want to add from a regular, regular, regulator perspective is that we are, again, I agree with you that in the government, we're, we're lag behind the private sector. And when we don't understand, we tend to be very protective of, our, of, of, of that. And, and then we also speculate on the risk. And for, for, for instance, as a central bank, our job is to be conservative, if, I mean, if not to say pessimistic, but our job is to be conservative. And so if we don't understand something, if you don't come and talk to us, we'll say, no, we, we don't want to touch that. Um, so you, you have to explain. Having said that, Annie, um, I'm glad that you mentioned it's about the digital banking because um, Cambodia's credit bureau is trying to have an MOU with the Singapore credit bureau for a very long time. We have agreed, and uh, I hope that is going to happen soon. It will, it will move you pretty fast now. Uh, <laughs> JJ, Angeline, do you have a comment on the question? Maybe we can take some yeah, more take some questions. Anyone else have a question? Maybe just collect that. Sure. Like this collection. Uh, thank you for the panel for interesting conversation. And uh, when the panel is uh, talking about data flow and data regulation, the word trust really pop up. And especially like the trusted data sharing framework, also the data flow with trust. So I'm wondering, since trust could not come out of nothing, so what are the essential elements underpinning the trust? Regulation or partnership or something else? So I'm wondering what's in your mind. JJ. Yeah. I, I think that uh, the fundamental building block of trust is predictability. And, and if a behavior is predictable, like, like how many of you would trust a, a robotic judge? A judge as a robot, yeah? But it has happened. China has uh, got an uh, e-court where you have a robotic judge. And there is a Supreme Court ruling in China that if it is supported by certain blockchain technologies, then it is accepted. So, so what it means is that how, how it is getting improved over a period of time is when AI becomes a lot more trustworthy. Because we have, to, we have to keep in mind that behind everything, there is an algorithm. And an algorithm is still written by a human being. And so which means that we cannot shy away from what we call as algorithmic bias. There will still be a certain amount of bias as we write algorithms. As this bias is taken away, 
as this bias becomes more neutralized, as artificial intelligence becomes more predictable, that will automatically give you trust. So, so that's why, so certain things that we have never imagined in our lifetime can happen, are happening and we are relying. And, and very soon we will rely on many others like driverless car or, or a robot taking care, like yesterday I was in that biometric mirror upstairs and, and it gave a lot of false things about me, but uh, starting from my age all the way down, I was very happy to see my age. But, <laughs> but it is true that there will be still certain mistakes, which means it has lost its trust. But, but that's where I think that as it builds upon and as trust comes in, the rest of it will follow. Um, I'll take uh, another question from this side. Yeah, lady in the front. So you just mentioned that a blockchain could be used like, for use data protection. So my question is, so what do you see the prospects of you know, having a personal or individual data trading in a market based on the blockchain? I think maybe this is a trend, but I don't know what's other prospects you think about it. I, we haven't agreed on the data flow rules and regulations, <laughs> let alone the trading of it. Yeah. Actually, um, so NTP, Network Trade Platform, uh, was set up by GovTech, and that sits with our customs office. And the idea is every time when you do trading, you have to put in lots of documentation, trade documentation. So that's not the same as an individual trading, all right? That is like individual information being traded. So right. Network Trade Platform is something that governments can do, and we are doing that. The single ASEAN window is something that is also facilitating that. But I really like that young man's question about trust. I don't think you can have any platform for trade or for any exchange of data if you don't have trust. So for NTP, for Network Trade Platform, we also have uh, Trade Trust, which is like a custodian of the information. So trust can only come about when you trust the custodian <laughs> who's holding the information. So data governance has to be set up not from a supervisory or regulatory angle, but a self uh, body, a, a body of players who you trust and who are actually doing some self-governance rules because you believe in it like a code of conduct. So, you know, if you are in China, we all believe that Jianghu, um, you know, there is this trust in, in the mandate that you will do the right thing. <laughs> So how do we create that kind of trusted community which can then be custodian of trusted data? So we are still many steps away and that's why this is only the conversation to start. Blockchain as a technology can be used for a lot of different traceability use cases but it hasn't reached a stage of the global network area for now. Right, well, I think we're going to... Do you have any more comments? It's okay. We have a minute left, so I think maybe we just take one. I'm just, just going to... I'm going to just wrap up, actually. So you have time for a, for a quick one. Uh, no, so, I mean, I think in terms of data and trust, um, so here I just actually met someone who is doing... Um, uh, using the blockchain to basically have companies talk to each other or governments talk to each other with information without having to disclose the actual information. So I think with technology, maybe we'll also be able to trust to share your information more with other players as long as you don't expose your own data. So as a private company, for example, I don't want to share my customer list to my competitors, right? But if there was a technology that could do so uh, that benefits everybody else, um, then, then I think maybe that's something that more people will start considering. We had a whole yeah. page on blockchain here. We just didn't get around <laughs> to it and Facebook and Libra and everything else. We're going to have to save that for another day. Just a quick way to, to wrap up. You know, look, the, the improvement and the digitization of ASEAN is uh, easy but not impossible. Uh, that's what we've heard from our, our panel. It requires a government, industry, private companies all working together. It requires new rules on data, data privacy, data flows. Uh, and ultimately, from what I've uh, heard today, it requires a lot of collaboration. So fascinating, face fascinating insight into all that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for listening. A round of applause for our wonderful panel. Thank you.